asking me, where did you come from? Uh, <clears throat> well, I was born in Louisiana, in the uh, south, in Monroe, Louisiana. And uh, I came, uh, my family uh, came to Oakland uh, when I was about one and a half. So uh, I've been here about, what, 34 years? I'm 35 now. Uh, I'm an old man. <laughs> but uh, I, I went to about every school in Oakland. We moved a lot. What was it like in your school? We were, we were being taught mostly about white people. We didn't have any books of our own. So uh, it wasn't, we didn't, uh, we didn't feel that, um, that the school uh, was teaching us anything about ourselves. So uh, it was a great problem uh, in school for me and for the uh, teachers. And um, that's why as I grew older, I always felt that uh, uh, as I grew older and learned about our true history, that uh, Africa, uh, before its conquest, was a beautiful, uh, cultured country. And uh, we had great universities uh, in Timbuktu. And I started to look at myself and get a new interest in, uh, in, uh, in education. And uh, so that's one of the reasons that I'm so proud of uh, your school. Wings to Fly is a children's book about gaining confidence and working to succeed, told from the perspective of a young girl who loves to play basketball. She is often left out by her teammates until she meets her guardian angel who teaches her that success takes perseverance. Wings to Fly is a great read for all children. I would highly recommend this book. If you would like to make a purchase, please click on the link in my description box below. Huey Percy Newton was born February 17, 1942 from Monroe, Louisiana. Due to racial discrimination and lots of violence against blacks, his family moved from Louisiana to Oakland, California. This was during the second wave of the Great Migration. Huey grew up committing many crimes. He was a very troubled youth. And in his own words, from his autobiography, Revolutionary Suicide, Huey states, During those long years in Oakland public schools, I did not have one teacher who taught me anything relevant to my own life or experience. Not one instructor ever awoke me in a desire to learn more or to question or to explore the worlds of literature, science, and history. All they did was try to rob me of my sense of my own uniqueness and worth, and in the process, nearly killed my urge to inquire. Huey bought several books on criminal law, burglary, and felony. He looked up as much as possible and tried to find out what kind of evidence was needed, what things were actually considered violations of the law, what the loopholes were, and what you can do to avoid being charged at all. But as a troubled young man, Huey still had one foot going down the right path and one foot in the streets. But the brother was trying. So Huey was robbing people, Huey was vandalizing, Huey was burglarizing, he was stealing. He would go into certain neighborhoods and break into people's homes, mostly white neighborhoods. Huey hung around the wrong folks who got him into lots of stuff. And he was always fighting. I mean, always fighting. One day, Huey was at a gathering with a bunch of people, and he began arguing with a man named Odell. Odell was a bully, and he started to press Huey. They were face to face, and Huey turned his back on him and began sitting down eating his dinner. Huey had a steak knife because he was cutting his steak. Odell snatched him by the arm and said, don't you ever turn your back on me. Huey turned his back again. Odell said, you must don't know who the hell you talking to. Odell began reaching towards his hip as if he was about to pull a gun. Huey told him, don't you draw a weapon while I got this knife on me. 
Dewey lunged at him and began stabbing him several times before he can even get a chance. Huey was later arrested and he was indicted for assault with a deadly weapon. Huey and his team fought for self-defense and he ended up getting off. He served about 22 months. Out of jail and back on the streets in 1965, he hooked up with Bobby Seale. Only our brother Martin Luther King exhausted a means of nonviolence with his life being taken by some racist. What is being done to us is what we hate. And what happened to Martin Luther King is what we hate. You darn right. We respect nonviolence. But to sit and watch ourselves be slaughtered like our brother, we must defend ourselves, as Malcolm X said, by any means necessary. See, he had known Bobby from back in the day. And now they had a lot to talk about. They haven't seen each other in about a year. He and Bobby used to always disagree but they were close. He had recruited Bobby into the Afro-American Association. Him and Bobby were involved in many different organizations before they created the Black Panthers. They were having a lot of meetings in Bobby Seale's living room. That was kind of like their headquarters. They all would sit in there and bounce ideas off of one another for hours and hours and hours. They would read tons of books, put their heads together, and try to come up with a plan. They studied everybody. They studied MLK. They studied Malcolm. They studied people like the Deacons of Defense. In 1964, the desegregation of Jonesboro, Louisiana High School was threatened by local authorities with fire hoses. Four armed black men arrived with loaded shotguns. Without firing a shot, the mob dispersed and the authorities retreated. The students entered the school without incident. Those men were members of the Deacons for Defense, an armed citizens militia founded in Jonesboro, Louisiana. The Deacons were everyday citizens who by 1965 had organized into more than 50 chapters throughout the South in self-defense from the Ku Klux Klan. In 1964, down in Louisiana, there were all types of demonstrations going on by Freedom Riders. Many times, the demonstrations would be met by armed white resistance. People were dying and being shot and intimidated because they were unarmed and basically because they were unarmed they were also being denied the right to vote. The Deacons protected civil rights workers for CORE, the Congress of Racial Equality, who were registering voters in Louisiana and Mississippi. They patrolled black neighborhoods and protected black churches where CORE was holding voting rights seminars. These were regular, everyday people. They were not some paramilitary group. The thing that made them different is they were veterans from the Korean War. They were veterans from World War II. And so they did have the training and they did have the discipline. They came from being veterans. Once the Klansman and the white citizen counselor and the deputy sheriff that was wearing the sheet at night learned that these deacons for defense would shoot back, then they were not as readily willing to go and pounce upon them in the wee hours of the morning. Are you going to do something about it? Because now they knew that, well, the right to bear arms is providing constitutional rights for these blacks, irrespective of the fact that we want to take away their civil rights. They're fighting on solid ground. The effectiveness of the Deacons in deterring violence was so great that Dr. Martin Luther King and Floyd McKissick of CORE hired the Deacons to protect the marchers from Klan aggression in the 1966 March Against Fear. The very effect 
of armed resistance in the name of civil rights is what really casts a new enthusiasm into the civil rights movement at a critical time. They looked into this political group called Lowndes County Freedom Organization, and they had a Black Panther for its symbol. A few days later, while him and Bobby was meeting, he was suggested that they use the Black Panther as their symbol and call our political vehicle the Black Panther Party. The panther is a fierce animal, but he will not attack unless he is backed into a corner. Then he will strike out. This image seemed appropriate, and Bobby agreed without discussion. Now they began recruiting heavy. All through the neighborhoods and the local colleges, the recruitment was on. What caught me at first was Bobby Hutton. The camera was on this young guy. He was my age, and he had a shotgun, and he was leading the whole uh, 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 delegation. And that kind of froze me in my tracks. I said, look at this. i never seen black people with guns before, especially at the Capitol. I mean, this is the first time ever kind of stuff. The very first member of the Black Panther Party was Bobby Hutton. Bobby Hutton had already known Bobby Seal from the North Oakland Service Center. Once the Panthers got the ball rolling, the numbers started increasing and everything started falling in place. They got their numbers up and the first thing they started to do was the local patrols. When we first started, we had a police alert patrol, and uh, we would uh, patrol the community. We, if we saw the police uh, brutalize anyone, we'd put an end to this. Usually, the police wouldn't brutalize anyone if we were on hand because we were armed, and uh, if the police arrested the individual, we'd follow him to the jail and bail the individual out, now, whether he was a panther or not. And we would gain many recruits like this, so therefore the community started to, uh, to, uh, to say that, well, these people are really concerned about our welfare. In the beginning, the patrols frightened and confused the police. The police didn't know how to respond. They had never seen black men walking around with guns like that. And they had no idea what was about to happen. They had many run-ins with the police. Sometimes the police drew their weapons and the Panthers drew theirs right back. Huey often felt that one day, the police will go crazy and pull the trigger. Huey said the police used to be so nervous that he always anticipated one of them to shoot. He said he would much rather a brave man pull a gun on him since he's less likely to panic. White America was terrified over this. See, this had him shook right here. Everything that they did they were well within their constitutional rights. Yeah, well that's legal too. If yours is legal, I don't see how y'all can be no better than us. You don't know the constitution, right? Not like this. Sure we do. We're well aware of the constitution. You have no right to take my gun away from me. You bring the constitution life. Right. That's all. He bring the law for me and arrest him. Suddenly, uh, they surrounded that service station, and then I told everybody, we take the arrests, you know, and put your guns down, we take the arrests, and they put, and the guns were really in the car, you know, at the service station, and then they come up and told me, he says, you're an arrest for carrying a concealed weapon. I said, you see this weapon, and you're calling it concealed. You're under arrest. <laughs> I said, oh my God, but I was never charged with that. I was charged with disturbing the peace of the California State Legislature. Is this the pamphlet you're talking about? The pamphlet says that the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense calls on the American people in general to take careful note of the racist California legislature. Why do you believe the legislature is, is racist? Don't you know? You're a part of it, and you're obviously it's a white system. It's not obviously where we're at. So. What, do you, what do you mean? Yeah. Yeah. Well, just read the pamphlet, and you'll see what we mean.
You say to read your pamphlet, this is the pamphlet that the man presented me with. It's called A Statement of the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense on the Mulford Act, now pending before the California legislature. The Mulford Act would control the use of arms, especially loaded weapons, and would prohibit them. These men seem to have loaded weapons with them. The statement seems to indicate that the, these people feel that the black people have been enslaved throughout most of their lives, that the white society is responsible for this, and then they go on to say the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense believes that the time has come for black people to arm themselves against this terror, the terror of the white people, presumably, before it is too late, and the pending Mulford Act brings the hour of doom one step nearer. The Mulford Bill passed the California legislature in July of 1967 by a huge majority. As soon as the law changed, making it illegal to carry loaded weapons, they had to stop their armed patrols. Now with the Panthers unarmed, the police was getting ready to go at them hard, just like the cowards they were. Well, first, uh, it's my intention to make it a felony to bring a loaded weapon into the state capitol. I think that uh, the incident points out that, uh, shockingly, that the laws are inadequate, but also serves to emphasize the fact that the laws are inadequate to uh, protect the innocent public when uh, bands of armed people, let me make it perfectly clear, this has nothing to do with any racial incident, because in my testimony yesterday there were five white groups I discussed and one Negro group. But when bands of armed people with loaded weapons can uh, uh, move about our streets intimidating and frightening citizens, then I think we should act and we intend to act. Sacramento, I led an armed delegation to the California State Legislature specifically to read executive mandate number one, that I, Eldridge, and Huey Newton effectively contributed to, to, the, to the writing of executive mandate number one. And that was uh, in opposition to the California State Legislature attempting and having a bill to stop us from carrying loaded weapons. In other words, they weren't saying you couldn't carry a weapon, you couldn't carry a loaded weapon inside city limits. So that's the law and reason, the reason I went to Capitol in the first place. I read the statement out front where Ronald Reagan was um, already speaking, but he was off to the side of the large, broad walkway leading up to the Capitol steps, to the legislative Capitol steps. Well, I think it's a ridiculous way to try and solve the problems that have to be solved among people of goodwill, and there's certainly nothing that can be done in the line of goodwill when Americans have guns, uh, uh, with the, even the implied idea that those guns might be directed against other Americans. In effect, the kids left him. He was speaking to a youth of America. He's, eight, nine, 10, 12 year olds, they saw us, the young white kids thought we were a gun club. They thought we had neat clothes and neat 30 odd sixes and stuff like this. And the press followed them. Huey P. Newton was a true rider. Huey fought hard for our communities and for the betterment of black people. He wasn't about to play no games with you. He took that Panther life very serious. You see, he understood what the movement was about. He understood what the movement needed to do. And he understood anything attached to that Panther name had to be revolutionary. This was a thorough brother. And he knew that destroying the Panther's name would mean you'd be destroying the Panthers. And that could lead to more destruction in our communities. Let me tell you how thorough he was. In February of 1967, Huey P. Newton heard of another Black Panther organization formed in San Francisco without his consent. David Hilliard labeled them the Paper Panthers. These fake Panthers earned the assignment of providing security for the widow of Malcolm X, Miss Betty Shabazz. And the fake Panthers from San Francisco invited the Oakland Black Panthers. During a confrontation with the police, one of the paper Panthers, a man named Roy Ballard, cowered down 
and begged the real Panthers to put down their guns. Huey then looked one of the cops in the face and told him that if they draw down, it'd be a bloodbath. You see, the cops only had revolvers, but the Panthers had shotguns and rifles. They had some serious artillery. Huey spotted Roy Ballard over there trembling in fear. Weeks later, it was confirmed that the Paper Panthers had no bullets in their guns. And so that means that the real Panthers stood alone in the altercation. So the Panthers went back to San Francisco to pay him a visit. They were having a fish fry and Huey walked up to him and gave him an ultimatum. Either change your name, join us, or we'll annihilate you right here, right now. They declined and Huey dropped one of them with a left hook. The Paper Panthers agreed to change their name. That's how thorough Huey was. As the sixth week of trial begins for Huey Newton, accused of killing an Oakland policeman, spectators and newsmen are searched before entering the courtroom. The dead man, Officer John Fry, was 23. Newton listens carefully, smiles at friends, sometimes holds up the clenched fist of militancy. There is one Negro on the jury, one Oriental, ten whites. Newton calls that proof of racism, systematic exclusion of Negroes. Defense attorney Charles Gary protested that the selection system made a fair trial impossible, but the judge ordered him to proceed. A key witness was Officer Herbert Haynes, wounded the night of the killing last October. He managed to get off at least one shot, which wounded Newton. Another state witness, Del Ross, failed to come through. He told the grand jury Newton forced him at gunpoint to drive to a hospital, but at the trial, Ross claimed he could remember nothing. Bus driver Henry Greer, however, touched Newton on the shoulder and identified him as the man he saw struggle with the slain officer, then shoot him several times. In the Alameda County Jail, Newton talks confidently of a not guilty verdict. Well, as I said, uh, when the case first started, that uh, we were sure that we would be victorious, and my opinion hasn't changed. We have uh, community support plus uh, across the country, plus uh, international support, and there's nothing stronger than the people. Three thousand Black Panthers turned out for the start of the trial. Spokesmen say that if Newton is found guilty and given the death penalty, the sentence will have to be carried out over their dead bodies. If there has to be war, said Eldridge Cleaver, the Panther information minister, then let there be war. The morning of Huey's trial, July 15, 1968, about 5,000 demonstrators and over 450 Black Panthers stood outside to show their support. Everybody was chanting, free Huey, free Huey, free Huey. Set our warrior free. Put it like this. If this happened in today's time, during the social media era, anything with Huey's name attached to it would have had millions of clicks. The free Huey movement was crazy at that time. Selecting the jury took a long time, about two weeks. All in all, three panels of prospective jurors, about 180 people were questioned before the jury and four alternates were chosen. Out of nearly 200 people, and only 16 of them were black. The final jury consisted of 11 whites and one black man named David Harper. And Huey studied David Harper heavily he found himself paying no attention at all to the testimony, prosecution witnesses, ballistic experts. Not until he took the stand himself, he began talking to the jury, and he felt like Harper had a connection with him. When he finally testified, he directed his words towards Harper. Harper was his audience. An unspoken bond grew between the two. He was convinced that Harper understood him and agree with him. And he only had a glimmer of hope within the jury. 
but never placed much confidence in him for his ability to sway others. In the opening statement to the jury, the prosecutor, Lowell Jensen, said that Huey had murdered Officer John Frey with full intent, and he also shot Officer Herbert Haynes. He said that Huey kidnapped a man named Dale Ross and forced him to take him to the hospital. The shooting happened at 5 a.m., approximately where I'm standing on 7th Street in the heart of Oakland's Negro ghetto. A pool of blood marks the spot where 23-year-old officer John Fry was found fatally wounded from four gunshots. Officer Fry, the father of a three-year-old daughter, had been on the force a little more than a year. Patrolman Herbert Haynes, who came to Fry's aid, is hospitalized in critical condition. He was found nearby, shot three times in the chest, arm, and leg. The suspect, charged with murder and attempted murder, is Huey Newton, 25-year-old leader of the Black Panthers for Self-Defense, an Oakland-based group that advocates arming all Negroes against what they call their white oppressors, especially police. The same group caused a storm when they entered the state capitol heavily armed earlier this year to protest anti-gun legislation. Newton is hospitalized in serious condition and under heavy guard. He staggered into Kaiser Hospital at 5.40 this morning with gunshot wounds in the abdomen. It is believed he was wounded by Officer Haynes. Newton was later transferred to Highland Hospital. Because of the condition of the two survivors of the pre-dawn shootout, exact details are missing. Police say Newton and an accomplice were in this car when stopped by Officer Fry. The car left at the murder scene is known to be one used by heavily armed Black Panthers to patrol Negro neighborhoods looking for what they say are incidents of police brutality. It is known Officer Fry was able to make several radio transmissions to check on possible warrants for the two suspects before he was killed. Newton and his accomplice fled on foot. It is believed Newton commandeered a car to take him to the hospital. Inspector Roland Fort has charge of the investigation. Police say Officer Fry's murder is the first time an Oakland policeman has been killed in the line of duty in nearly 20 years. A huge manhunt is on for the second suspect in that killing, who is still at large. Ben Williams, KPIX News in Oakland. He claimed that Huey gave false identification to the first officer who stopped him. And when he was stopped the second time, he gave the correct identification. And as he was arrested, walking towards the car, he pulled a gun and began firing. He claimed that he shot Officer Frey with his own gun. Then he claims that Huey escaped and forced Dale Ross to take him to another location in Oakland. Jensen claimed that Huey had three motives. First, was because he had a prior conviction for a felony and was on probation. Because of this, he knew that having a concealed weapon would lead to another felony conviction. Two, he claimed that Huey had marijuana in the car. Three, was because of the claim from false identification. Which is hilarious because when he was pulled over, the police knew exactly who he was. When he got pulled over, the cops stepped to him with something like, well, 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 what do we have here? The great Huey P. Newton. So they knew who he was. Another matter of concern was whether to reveal to his attorney the name of Gene McKinney, who was the passenger that night the incident went down. You see, Gene was never approached by the police. He was never apprehended. Only when his lawyers had convinced him that legally the prosecution could not do anything to Gene McKinney if he revealed his identity. From Huey's own knowledge of the law, he knew that the courts were powerless to hurt Gene, but Gene was skeptical. When his lawyers finally met with Gene, they carefully explained to him that he could not be hurt by testifying for the defense. And he eventually did testify. 
The prosecution took about three weeks to present its case. They called in about 20 witnesses to the stand. This included people like the nurse who admitted him, the doctor who did the autopsy on Officer Frey, ballistics experts, several people from the police department, and various others from the shooting. The so-called witness who was the bus driver, he got up there and gave a bogus testimony. He was attorney found out later on that he was in some type of trouble with the law and he was cooperating to get out of something. On Monday, August 12th, 1967, a black man named Dale Ross was about to take the stand. This was the guy who claimed that Huey P. Newton and Gene McKinney kidnapped him right after the shooting. Right after the shooting, he claims that they held him at gunpoint and they told him that he needs to flee the scene. When Dale Ross was questioned, he responded, I refuse to answer on the grounds it will tend to incriminate me. Everyone was shocked because this was a victim, a supposed to be victim, not a defendant. So why is he pleading the fifth? Come to find out, he had lied due to police intimidation. And they also had something on him. Parking tickets. This man was willing to do great damage to Huey P. Newton, a black man at that over some parking tickets. On the morning of August 22nd, Huey finally took the stand. And Huey calmly answered the questions and denied everything that he needed to deny. No matter how out of pocket the courtroom got, Huey remained calm. The jury deliberated for a few days from September 5th until September 8th. Many people wondered what the Black Panthers would do when the verdict came down. The brothers had already said sky was the limit if they did not free Huey. So everyone was contemplating, everyone was worried and afraid. If Huey was not a free man, that it was going up. The long-awaited decision in the Huey Newton murder trial, which has drawn worldwide attention, is now very near. The jury of seven women and five men are deliberating the fate of the Black Panther leader on the eighth floor of that building. It is their job to decide whether he is guilty of killing Oakland policeman John Fry and wounding Officer Herbert Haynes in a pre-dawn shootout last October 28th. Two floors above the jury in his cell, Huey Newton, who has made almost no show of emotion during the eight weeks of trial, calmly awaits the decision of the jury. I talked to Newton in the jail. Uh, as far as the, the proceedings uh, thus far, that uh, uh, the courts uh, have only reflected the racist uh, attitude of the general power structure, that I haven't received a fair trial that I should not have been indicted in the first place. I was indicted by a blue ribbon grand jury, uh, a middle class white grand jury that w did not represent a cross section of the community. And but when it was time for the verdict, it was manslaughter. And Huey sent a message to the community after he had the chance to analyze the verdict. This was his statement. The question has been asked, what do I think of the verdict? What do I think of the jury? I think the verdict reflected the racism that exists here in America and that all black people are subjected to. Some specific things I would like to say about certain people on the jury first. Brother Harper and other members of the jury who believed in my innocence owed an obligation to me and the black community to adhere to their convictions that I was not guilty. 